Hey everybody, welcome to session 1.3. Um, this is where we're going to talk about the U.S. legal system as it relates to nonprofit organizations. I do this class session early in the semester because it helps me lay a groundwork for concepts that we're going to be coming back to repeatedly through the remainder of the semester. If you're a law student or you have a background in the law, there are a lot of concepts here that are going to be familiar to you, but you might find it interesting in, in how they apply to nonprofits specifically. The goals for this class session, I want you to be able to explain the federal legal system. I want you to be able to explain common law and how it's different from legislated law. I want you to be able to explain certain constitutional rights and how they are important to nonprofits. I want you to be able to identify and explain the legal characteristics of persons, corporations, and trusts. I want you to finally be able to explain the following concepts. We're going to talk about different kinds of civil claims. We're going to talk about standing jurisdiction and a concept called justiciability. So let's talk about where law comes from in uh, the United States. In the U.S. we have what's called a federal legal system and what that means is we have a federal government that oversees national laws and then we have state governments that each oversee the laws in, uh, unique to their specific state. This is a pretty unique legal system in the in the world. There aren't a lot of other countries that have a similar setup. The original concept on our founding was that uh, the federal government would simply reflect important national priorities, but each state government will be relatively independent. And there's a lot of there's a lot to that still that is true. Although obviously the federal government has grown quite a bit since our found, since the founding of our country. Um, these laws, these powers come from constitutional rights uh, provided to the federal and state powers. Um, and so really all this stuff comes from the U.S. Constitution. For example, the, federal, the Constitution allows that both the federal and state governments are allowed to levy taxes and to establish courts to enforce their own laws. Part of what that means is that state courts enforce state laws, federal courts enforce federal laws. There are times where a federal court can enforce state law or vice versa, but those are pretty limited in circumstance. There are a lot of other federal powers that we'll talk about, but I just want to focus on one that's important to nonprofits, which is, which is that the federal government can regulate what's called interstate trade. And that's any time that business is being done across state lines. This is a unique federal power. This is, for example, why you're not charged sales tax by buying something from another state. Um, we're going to talk about that concept later in the semester, but uh, because state t sales taxes cannot cross state borders. Um, and so what that means is that uh, only the federal, go federal government can regulate the tra trade that happens between state between like over state lines. States, for their part, can create laws around crimes. Um, they can make anything criminal. You might be familiar with a lot of federal crimes that exist, but all federal crimes have to be based on some other federal power like a law that re like a crime related to interstate trade or a crime related to the tax code but uh, at the state level you don't have to have some other power that gives you the right to create a crime or to make something a crime it it, it just comes purely from being a state uh, states can also regulate what's called intrastate trade meaning any any uh, commerce happening within the boundaries of the state and then finally, they can regulate the general health and safety of the people. This is something referred to as the police power. Now, within that federal legal system, those powers uh, are embodied in organizations that can enforce the laws subject to their purview. And so under the federal government, you've got the Department of Treasury that enforces tax law through the IRS. The IRS is part of the Department of Treasury. And the Department of Justice will enforce other criminal laws that uh, have been written under the federal power. Whereas at the state level, you've got more organizations that are relevant to nonprofits. We talked about how the attorney general can uniquely oversee nonprofits. Uh, in a previous class session, um, the Department of Commerce is the entity within the state that oversees corporations and, get, and, and creates charters for corporations. In some states, that's the Secretary of State instead of the Department of Commerce. Um, the tax division obviously oversees tax issues, and not just income tax issues for nonprofits, but also property tax and sales tax issues. And then finally, the employment division oversees any employer, which includes nonprofit employers. Now, we need to talk about how laws created in the United States. There are actually two ways, or three ways, really, that laws created. Um, th but a lot of our law comes through what's called a common law system. And I'm just going to kind of talk through really quickly how common law works. 
uh, common law goes way back. It goes back centuries. It's actually, it's older than, than the United States actually, because we imported a lot of common law from Great Britain when we uh, organized ourselves as a separate country after the revolution. But anyway, here's how it works. So let's say Steve buys a cow from Mike, but doesn't pay for it. So Mike, of course, sues Steve. So he brings Steve to court and says, hey, we had an agreement that Steve would buy my cow, but he didn't pay for the cow. The judge in that case, Judge One, will say, he'll think about it and he'll say, you know what? If you're going to agree to buy something, you should, you should have to pay for it and courts can make you pay. So this is where a new law is created. And judges create law all the time in the United States. I know that there's a political accusation of, of activist judges creating law, but the reality is our legal system was designed that way. And we want judges creating law because, and we'll talk about reasons why common law is better than legislated law. But as a general rule, that's how law works in the United States, is that judges create law. Now, this law ideally becomes what's called a precedent, which means it creates a rule for future circumstances. So if we fast forward and we find Adam buying a cow from Beth but doesn't pay for it, so Beth then sues Adam, well, Judge 2 is going to look at the circumstances. He's going to say, you know what? This is just like the case of Steve versus Mike. And I guess technically it'd be Mike versus Steve because you list the plaintiff first. But the point is, is this is just like the case of Mike versus Steve. And in that decision, the judge said that if you agree to buy a cow, then you have to pay for it. Well, here in Beth v. Adam, um, I'm going to use the exact same rule as Judge 1. And so Judge one will use, Judge 2 will use Judge 1's decision to make Adam pay. So this is just reinforcing old law, using it again as precedent. Well, let's fast forward a little bit. And here we have Mary buying a cow from Cole, but doesn't. But Mary doesn't pay for it. So Cole sues Mary, but Mary comes to court with a defense. Mary says, I'm not paying for this cow because it's defective. Well, Judge 3 in this situation looks back at the decision made by Judge 1, and he says, you know what? In that case of Mike versus Steve, the cow that Steve was buying was a good cow. But here, Mary is buying a defective cow. And so I'm not going to make Mary pay for a defective cow. I'm going to use a different rule in this case that says that you don't have to pay for defective cows. And so here new law is created. And this is created because it's different from the circumstance in the first case. And so this is how common law is built up over time. We sort of take a circumstance and we say, well, what's fair in this case? We look at old law to help inform us, to help us decide what's fair. But if we confront a circumstance that's new, then as a judge, we can write new law. This works, and it's important. Uh, I mentioned already first that it's founded in English law. We imported a whole bunch of common law into the United States at the state level. So all the colonies, when they became states, basically imported um, uh, British law to get started because there are all those good rules, so we might as well hold on to it. And like I said in my description, it's based on judicial decisions that have been made over time. i got to pause. There's somebody at my door. Okay, I'm back. Um, anyway, so it's based on judicial decisions um, that accumulate over time. And so uh, what that means is that judges are creating law, just like we talked about, and it accumulates. It adds up over time. Now, this is all deliberate. This is all the, the way the system is actually supposed to work. Um, now, this is different from legislated law. Uh, legislated law is made by elected representatives. So we send people to Congress, we send people to our state legislature, and they write laws. What's important to remember about, uh, about legislated law is that, first, it always overrides common law, meaning that, uh, meaning that if a judge creates a rule that a legislature doesn't like, then the legislature can just change the law. Um, now, that might depend on how the law works, though. Sometimes courts actually strike down legislated law, but they only do that because it might violate the Constitution whether it's the federal constitution at, at, the, at the congressional level or the state constitution at the state legislature level. Because courts, the part of their purpose is to resolve conflicts between laws. And if the constitution says one thing and then a state uh, statute says another thing, then the constitution wins. And courts are the ones who make those determinations. And so... Um, Legislative law is also always subject to overriding law, and like I was talking about with the Constitution versus statute versus regulation. So to, to kind of describe what's going on in that, in that graphic there, uh, the Constitution was created by a constitutional convention. That's true both at the federal level and at the state level. 
and it can be changed by constitutional convention or by um, uh, two thirds of, of Congress and uh, three quarters of the states approving a change to the constitution, which has happened multiple times. We've amended the constitution a lot in the course of our history. Um, and then legislatures are empowered by constitutional rights statutes. Congress writes statutes, state legislatures write statutes. But then legislatures and Congress can also delegate that law writing power to agencies. And so, for example, in the federal tax code, you've got a whole section of federal tax code, but then you've got volumes and volumes of treasury regulations that further interpret the tax code. And those are, and it's the treasury department that writes and, and, and creates those uh, regulations. And that's how legislative law works. Um, one interesting thing to note is that uh, in, when it comes to common law versus legislative law, there's no such thing as pure federal common law, but there is pure common law at the state level, meaning that in, in the state, there can be common, there can be a law that only goes back to judicial decisions. But at the federal level, there has to be either a constitutional provision or a statute at the foundation of any decision made by a judge. Whereas at the state level, you can just go all the way back through common law. All right. As far as the Constitution as a source of law is concerned, the, the, the U.S. Constitution, there are some constitutional rights important to nonprofits that I want to briefly address. Um, I want to talk about the First Amendment. Um, the right to free speech is fundamental to nonprofit activity. Um, nonprofits have historically spoken up vociferously and actively on all kinds of issues. And uh, they lobby constantly. Um, and this is all related to this uh, right to free speech. The right of association, which is interpreted from the First Amendment by the Supreme Court, because the First Amendment provides for a right to assembly, and the courts have interpreted that to include a right to associate with each other. And that means we can organize together and form a nonprofit. And that's what the right of association guarantees. And we also uh, should talk about the right to free exercise, and that's uh, freedom of religion, essentially. And this right is also critical to the nonprofit sector because so much nonprofit activity happens through religious activity. And then I just briefly want to draw attention to the Tenth Amendment. The Tenth Amendment has something critical called the Residual Powers Clause. And it basically says that any rights not claimed by the federal government in the Constitution are automatically delegated to the states. And this basically is where most state powers come from, is from the residual powers clause. And what this means is that, or how this relates to nonprofits, this is why nonprofits are incorporated at the state level and not almost ever at the federal level. To have a federally incorporated nonprofit literally requires an act of Congress, whereas to have a state incorporated nonprofit, you just have to go online and fill out the form. And this kind of a thing comes from or devolves from the residual powers clause provided in the, in the Constitution. All right, let's talk about legal entities. And I don't mean entities like the Department of Treasury. I mean the people who might bring things to court. Um, there, you have, there are three types of legal entities that I want to talk about as it relates to nonprofits. And these are things we're going to elaborate more on in the next class session. But basically, you like think about somebody who's bringing a lawsuit or is getting sued. A person can sue and be sued. A corporation can also sue and be sued. And and so in that sense, they're kind of like a person. They're at the very least a legal entity. And trusts can kind of be sued. The trustee, the person who runs the trust, is the person who gets sued as an individual. Um, but lawsuits can exist for trust as well. A person, people can own property, corporations can own property, trustees own property in the name of the trust. Um, and then finally, persons can be taxed by the federal government and corporations can be taxed by the government and trusts can be taxed, actually. And there are special uh, laws, uh, tax laws made just for trusts. What's important to remember is that the rights associated with these entities come from different places. The legal rights of a person are reflected in statutes, but they're really natural rights, meaning that you have a right to speech just by being born. Now, it might be embedded somewhere in the Constitution or some other federal or state law, but the right to speech is something that comes by virtue of being a human being. That's not necessarily true for corporations or trusts. Rights for corporations and trusts come from statute. They, these entities exist only because our laws say they exist. And if our laws said corporations don't exist anymore, then that would 
be a, a, a fully reasonable change, at least as far as philosophy of law is concerned. And the same is true for trust. They exist because statutes say they can exist. Whereas human beings exist whether no matter what the law says about them, and their rights are real no matter what the law says about them. That's not true for corporations or trusts. The majority of nonprofits operate as corporations, by the way, something that I think I've referenced, but I want to make sure is, in, is stressed. Okay, let's talk about how the law is enforced in the United States. Generally speaking, the law is enforced because a cause of action has, has, has occurred. This is an event that gives rise to a legal claim of some kind. In civil law, that mostly happens when there's an injury to a person or property or something like that. In criminal law, it's an injury that occurs to society. Um, you, there's no such thing as um, a, a, a private individual bring, like bringing a cause of action for a criminal case. That can only ever be criminal law is only enforced by representatives of the of the state or federal government. Um, state or federal attorneys are the ones who bring who who bring criminal charges to court. Uh, you guys have probably heard the phrase "pressing charges." Um, you as an individual have no power to force a criminal charge brought against a person. Only a, a state or federal attorney has the power to do that. So, um, but but you can enforce, but you can bring a claim to court if somebody has violated the civil law as it relates to you. Um, if you want to bring a claim to court, then you need three elements. Um, you have to have what's called standing. You have to have bring your case to a court that has jurisdiction and the issue that you're bringing has to be what's called justiciable. Let's talk about standing for a minute. Standing is a legal right to pursue a claim in court. It happens because, one, it happened to you personally, meaning it didn't happen to somebody else. You can't bring a legal claim that ha- for, a, for an injury that happened to your neighbor, for example. Your neighbor has to be the one to file it, not you. Whatever was done has to be done in a way that's against the law, obviously. And finally, there has to be a chance for relief, which is the legal word for the court has to have a way to fix the problem. Um, so the kinds of claims you can bring as a, as, a, as a private individual, if you're bringing a civil claim to court, if you're suing somebody, generally fall into three categories. The first is a tort. This is where you commit a wrongful act, whether intentional or accidental, which injures somebody else or their property. Um, by the way, in class, remind me, I'll tell you what my favorite legal term is. It has to do with torts. Um, you can bring a contract violation to court if you've come to an agreement with somebody where there was a promise to exchange something of value. Uh, that's called consideration, the value that's being exchanged. Um, then a con- if you made that promise or agreement with somebody, then a contract is formed. And breaking the contract is something you can, you can file a, a civil claim about. And then finally, sometimes laws are created that give you a specific right for a civil claim just because the law says so. So this is where any claim of damages or equity results because the legislature has written something into the law that giving you that right. And I'll give you some examples of statutory claims in class. So let's say that somebody has, has committed an a, a, a unlawful cause against you. They've hurt you or in some way or broke a promise or whatever then you need to bring it to court, but you have to bring it to the right court. Not all courts have jurisdiction over laws that have been violated. For example, you might bring, try to bring a federal claim in a state court and the state court will generally will kick it out and say, no, you got to file this in federal court. And the reverse is true. You might be filing for a claim that is under the law of the state of Utah. If you bring that to federal court, the federal court will send you to the, to the state court. And so different courts have different jurisdiction, um, and that also depends on where it happens in the country, not just um, which laws, not just whether it's a federal or state law issue. Uh, this map just shows you the federal circuit courts. We're going to talk about um, the sort of like structure of appealing cases, and uh, in federal courts, uh, the they appeal through the proper um, uh, federal circuit, which is illustrated there in Utah. You can see we're in the tenth federal circuit. It's important to stress that there's no single government entity that has absolute and complete jurisdiction. The federal government has certain state laws. I mean, the federal government has certain ways that they're not allowed to enforce state law. And that's true even for the U.S. Supreme Court. You could take a state issue to the U.S. Supreme Court and they'll kick it out. And they've actually done that multiple times. 
And then finally, this last concept is called justiciability. And these are just a few attributes that make sure that the issue that you're bringing is appropriate for a court to determine. For example, you have to be bringing something where the decision of the court actually makes a difference, meaning you're not asking just for their advice or feedback. You're not asking them to issue a hypothetical ruling, for example, but their ruling actually has to force a change in the world, meaning somebody has to pay damages or somebody has to stop a certain behavior. Obviously, for it to be justiciable, a plaintiff has to have standing, which we've talked about. Um, the facts that are underlying the issue have to reflect what's called a substantial controversy that is not already resolved. Um, this can sometimes be an issue if, for example, you're suing, and then in the process of the lawsuit, the person you're suing changes the behavior to make it right. Well, if they've changed the behavior to make it right, the court's going to say, oh, this has been resolved, and they'll kick it out. And so there has to be a controversy that's, that's at stake, and it can't already be resolved uh, for the court to be able to rule on it. And finally, the issue can't be what's considered purely political. Now, there's a lot of law determining what's political or not, but the general concept to understand is that courts are going to stay away from issues that they think should be resolved by voters or legislatures. And there have been plenty of times that courts have stepped away from political questions. Now, obviously, courts determine things all the time that have political implications. But if they do so, the political implications are kind of an afterthought. Well, not an afterthought, but they're an after effect. The, the, there, there always has to be a substantial controversy at stake that's not just a purely political question. Um, so anyway, that's, that's the class session, and uh, I look forward to seeing you all in class.